All right. If you were here last week, you remember that we had talked about angels and demons and ghosts and what the Bible has to say about them. And what the Bible says and what we've been taught since we were children were two very different things. And today we're going to take a look at heaven and hell. And if you grew up in the church, and even if you didn't, you're probably familiar with the idea that when we die, we all go to either heaven or hell, a place of paradise or torment, depending on whether we were naughty or nice in life. And it surprises most people when they start reading the scripture to find out that these concepts aren't very deeply rooted in scripture. So first we're going to look at heaven and what it means to go to heaven. First, there's only three people in scripture, maybe three people, that have been said to have ascended to heaven. Now, Jesus ascended to heaven in Luke chapter 24. In 2 Kings 2, we see that Elijah ascends to heaven on a chariot of fire. And in Genesis chapter 5, it says that Enoch was taken by God. Now, this does not necessarily mean that Enoch never died, but it is different from the other phrasings of the uh, patriarchs of his time. And in the apocryphal book of Enoch, it is interpreted as meaning that Enoch never died, that he too ascended to heaven. That's why I say there are maybe three people in scripture. Enoch is that maybe. But heaven is a place that is referenced in the Old Testament, and it is referenced as the place where God's throne resides, and where a host of heaven, according to 1 Kings 22.19, gathers around the Lord. And depending on the book you read, this host of heaven is described differently. In Psalm 82, it says, God provides excuse me, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. Now this language of a divine council of the the gods meeting in the throne room of our God, this is found in Genesis as well, that we... And it, it begs the question, are we monotheists at all? Or are we, as some suggest, henotheists? Do we believe that there is one God? Or do we believe that there is only one God who is worth worshiping? Well, in Job 1.6, this same host of heaven, or the assembly of the gods is referred to as the sons of God. And so, depending on the Old Testament author and how you want to interpret this, God is either surrounded by all the gods of the earth. And remember last week we talked about gods in Hebrew being Elohim, and this word is very uh, malleable. It even refers to the, the spirit of Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel when Saul summoned, well, not Saul specifically, the witch of Endor summons the spirit or Elohim of Samuel. That word does not mean the God of Samuel. It means Samuel himself. It means his spirit. And so this is a very malleable word. But in Psalms 82 it does appear to mean the gods of the nations. Whereas in Job, it says sons of God, and that phrase is found in Genesis, when the sons of God take the daughters of man and bear the Nephilim. And so this also has some deeply 
uh, mystical roots in apocryphal and pseudopigraphal works of the Old Testament. We see that this is something that is very, um, very difficult to interpret, but I want to frame it in the light of Psalm 82, because if God here is presiding in the great assembly and rendering judgment of the gods, then God, our God, has judged all the gods of the nations. Those who bear his message to the world, those are found faithful, but those who are, as we'll see later, lying angels, those who do not bear his message truthfully, God has judged them. But if we interpret Psalm 82 to mean like Job, sons of God, if we interpret that to mean the church, then that, take, that psalm takes on a very different meaning. Because sons of God, that refers to in the New Testament, the church. We are the brothers and sisters of Christ. We are sons of God. And so, if God is giving judgment over the sons of God, then that means that God has judged his church. The question is, are we bearing his message faithfully? Are we taking it to the nations faithfully? And that puts us in a very uncomfortable place. Just without thinking, now I told you we were going to talk about heaven and hell and the afterlife, but here we haven't even gotten to the afterlife and we're already in a place of judgment. But I want to go back, but I want, I want to put a pin in that and we'll come back to that point. Let's talk about the afterlife first. You see, in Hebrew, the afterlife is called Sheol. And this word means the grave. It is literally the grave. You put someone who has died in Sheol. You bury them in Sheol. That is the grave, literally. But figuratively, it could mean the afterlife. And in the Septuagint, this word Sheol is translated as Hades. Now, Hades doesn't refer to a literal grave. It refers to that afterlife. And so in Hebrew, Sheol is figuratively the afterlife, but in Greek, it is literally the afterlife. And so when we look at the Old Testament, we see some of these passages that really don't talk about the afterlife, and some of them that might, and it's ambiguous, but when we look in the New Testament, that was written in Greek, and so we also have to wonder when we see Hades, or sometimes that's translated as hell, but it shouldn't be because Hades encompasses all of the afterlife, not just um, some torturous part, but this is heaven and hell and everything in between. We're left with that ambiguity. In Psalm 139, we know that Hades is not hell because it says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there too. Wherever we go, God is there. If there is an afterlife, we will not be separated from God, even in Sheol. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, Jesus declares that he will deliver the dead from Hades. Because he says, and note this is in Caesarea Philippi, and there is 
a temple there to Dionysus, and Jesus is literally standing in the place where this temple exists. And in the temple to Dionysus is thought to be a portal to Hades. There is a cave, and people would give their sacrifices into the cave as offerings to the dead. And Jesus says of this place, this place which represents Rome and Hades, he says to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not stand against it. Now Peter then proclaims Jesus the Messiah, and then Jesus talks about his death. Jesus is not overlooking where he is standing. He is talking about it. But when he says the gates of Hades will not stand against the church, which way is the church storming the gates of Hades? Or is it the church? Is it Jesus himself that is storming the gates of Hades? Because we know when Jesus died, he went into Hades. He went into the grave. He was placed in a tomb. A stone was rolled in front of it. That's Hades. That is Sheol. But when he rose from the dead, that is when he stormed the gates of Hades. When he died, he went into Hades, as any normal person does. But when he rose from the dead, that is not normal. That is when Jesus stormed the gates of Hades and rescued the dead who were in it. Now, that is the harrowing of hell, and I know that would, that theology splits the church. But this is what we proclaim. Christ rose from the dead. That the gates of Hades will not stand against his church. When Jesus rose, he brought his church out of the grave itself. So, that points us to what most Jews and Christians of the first century would recognize as an afterlife concept. Because this idea of dying and going to heaven or hell didn't really resonate in the minds of the first century church. What they recognized was the idea of the day of resurrection. You see, their hope was for all people to be raised from the dead into new bodies and stand before the Lord on a new earth in a new Jerusalem, just like it talks about in Revelation. Paul even talks about this when he's on trial in Acts chapter 24. He says, However, I admit, I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call, he's talking about the Pharisees, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. That is our hope. Not that we will go to Sheol or to heaven, that we will have an, a good afterlife or an eternal afterlife. Our hope is that we go from life to life. Our hope is the resurrection of the dead, just as Jesus was resurrected. So, if there is no hell, and we don't go to heaven, where do we get this idea of hell? Well, just like Sheol is translated as Hades, so too is Gehenna, or Tartarus, translated as hell. And Gehenna is the valley of Gai bin Hinnom. It's just south of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is up on a hill, and there are two valleys. Gai bin Hinnom is the valley to its south. Now, in ancient times, 
Gehenna was the place of child sacrifice to the Canaanite god Molech. And so this was a place of suffering. You didn't go to Gehenna because you were having a good time, because you were in a good place in life. You were going there because you are suffering and because you are going to the one God you think can alleviate that suffering. And it is a horrible, horrible thing to go to Gehenna. And so in the New Testament, this is uh, linked to the pit of Tartarus, the place in Hades where souls are tormented. These two concepts exist side by side in the first century because Jews are speaking both Hebrew and Greek. They remember their ancient past when their ancestors worshipped other gods and, how, and the horrible, horrible things that they did in the name of those gods. But others work closely with the Greeks and Romans, and they are closer to this idea of Tartarus. And some, like where Paul was preaching in Galatia, those churches only know about Tartarus. If you say Gehenna to them, they have no reference for that. They don't know where that is. So that's why 1 Peter talks about Tartarus. So in Luke chapter 16, Jesus is talking about Gehenna. Of course, the word he uses is not Gehenna, it's Hades. But it's obvious that the place in Hades he's talking about is Tartarus. So I want to read this to you. So you can get an idea. This is one of only two places where we see a concept of hell in the entire Bible. So, Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now I want you to notice the difference. That the rich man, when he dies, is buried. When Lazarus dies, he goes to a place of comfort. But both have died. They both go to Sheol. For it says, in Hades, where he, that is the rich man, was in torment. Now, Jesus is saying Hades, but he's talking about Tartarus. Why is he saying this? Well, Jesus is talking to a group of Jews, and the only place we see Tartarus used is in 1 Peter. The only place we see it is in a letter written to a Greek, ch a Greek church. And I think that this idea that, Laz that Lazarus goes to Abraham's side, but the rich man goes to Hades, I think it tells us about how they lived their lives. That Lazarus was steeped in the ways and traditions of his people. Whereas the rich man saw things from a very Roman pr perspective. He was buried and went to Hades, the Roman afterlife, where he was in torment. It tells us what kind of life he lived, in other words. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side, so he called to him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus excuse me, I've lost my place, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, 
Remember that your life that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are suffering. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Now this has been the subject of theologians for a long time. Who put the pit there? It's almost a comical question. Who put the pit in place? This is Tartarus. Its very nature is it is a pit where there is suffering. But it begs the question, who dug the pit? Abraham implies that the things they did in life brought them to where they are now in Sheol. But it also implies something else. It implies that what they are suffering or what they are experiencing in Sheol is proportional to the things they did in life. So if Lazarus's comfort is proportional, so is the rich man's suffering. But that also means that neither is eternal, because what can we do in life in a limited span of time that would earn us something eternal? I want to tell you that this is not the Christian idea of hell. It is the Greek idea of Hades, and people move freely, for the most part, in Hades. If the rich man dug this pit for himself in life, if his torture is proportional to what he did in life, he dug his way in. He can dig his way out. But the rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then even if someone rises from the dead, they will not be persuaded. Here Jesus is foreshadowing his own message, his own purpose, his own death. He will rise from the dead. He will proclaim the good news to all who are lost that even if you're digging this pit in life, you don't have to spend eternity there. You can dig your way back out. You see, there is hope. There is salvation. And on the day of resurrection, there is judgment. But what does that judgment look like for us, for us Christians and for us human beings? Was the judgment set up for us or has it already been done? Turning to Revelation chapter 20, we see a passage about the lake of fire and the lake of fire is the final judgment. Its only permanent occupants are Satan, which means the accuser, and who is the devil, which means the bearer of false witness. And this is the theme of everyone we see who enters this lake of fire, that they bear false witness. First, Satan. Now, who is Satan bearing false witness against? Well, in Job, he bears false witness against the righteous Job. And that is who he is bearing false witness against. He is saying, look at how sinful they are. These humans you created, God. Look at how awful they are. But in Hebrews, we're told that Jesus is our high priest and that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. Jesus is our defender. So if Satan is bearing false witness, then he is lying to God while Jesus 
tells God the truth on our behalf. Jesus tells God what our intentions are. Satan can only bear what they look like. So we see that Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. So is the beast. And in the book of Revelation, the beast is someone who gains power due to the devil's false witness. And the false prophet, someone who leads people astray based on that false witness. And it seems that they are tormented until they confess the truth. Do I think that they will spend eternity there? No, I think that this is hyperbole. Just like when we see that Edom, that the smoke of God's wrath rises from Edom forever in the Old Testament, if you were to go to the place where Edom was, you will not see a smoking pit. You will see the kingdom of Jordan. But it is not the kingdom of Edom. It is the kingdom of Jordan. There is a whole different people group settled there. There is a whole different kingdom. It is no longer Edom. God judged Edom and destroyed it, and it is there no more. That is not to say that Edom is forever being destroyed. It is to say that God rendered his judgment and his judgment is permanent. That is what is eternal, not the destruction. So, do I think that they will spend eternity? No. No. I believe in a God of mercy and love. I don't believe in a God that torments people forever. Now, it says, those who are destroyed by fire and brimstone of God's wrath. Fire and brimstone we see throughout the scripture as an analogy of God's wrath. That's what it represents. And those include death, because there is no more death. And Hades, because there are no more dead. No one's in Hades as well as those who are the enemies of life and truth. So I'll read this quickly to you. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released. Sorry, Revelation 20, verses 7 through 15. It says, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, who are possibly the Antichrist and his followers... and to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. And what's interesting about this phrase is in Greek, it actually sounds like fire and the gods. This uh, word, brimstone, sounds very much like theos. I think, if I remember correctly, it is theoi. It's only one letter different. That God here is judging those Elohim, that we saw standing in his court in Psalms 82. And those who bore false witness, he throws into the lake of fire and brimstone to bear his wrath, where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. They will be examined by torture day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were distinguished according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, in some translations, this will say judged. In some, it'll say distinguished, and distinguished 
Well, we see this kind of in Genesis chapter 2, where Adam distinguishes the animals from one another. They're all lined up before Adam to be judged as to whether or not they are a suitable companion to humankind, and Adam names them one by one. Here, we see something similar. The dead were named according to what they had done as recorded in the books. They're given new bodies. They're given new names. Now, if this is judgment, it's judgment to enter the city. You see, how are we going to know one another? By the names God gives us on that day. And if we've done good things, if we have lived for Christ, we'll be given good names. But what if we haven't? What if we've done terrible things? What of the Hitlers and Genghis Khans and Mussolinis of the world? What name will they be given? Well, it's probably not going to be a very good name. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The dead and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was distinguished or named according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So here we have judgment of death of the great liar of Satan and his gods or angels. And we have the judgment of those who are the enemies of life itself. I don't know who would count as the enemies of life and truth. I honestly can't think of anyone who would um, meet a standard that high. But I do see a lot of personifications of concepts. Death, Hades, Satan. These are high concepts being destroyed because God is recreating the world. And how many people, how many names are written in God's book of life? I think this can go that we can read this from the entire church to just those most deserving, or even as wide as everyone who has ever lived. I certainly don't think that God judges what we do in this life so harshly as to deny us an eternity. Perhaps we don't go into that eternity with the best name. Perhaps we don't. Perhaps we have to suffer a bit in the interim. But ultimately, we all receive the same reward. And this life is where we get to practice for the next one. This life is where we get to get it right. Because Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. I don't know who's saved and who's not. I don't think we all go to heaven and I don't think any of us go to hell. And I think that if there is such a thing as an afterlife, it is to prepare us for that day of resurrection. Where each and every one of us will see the face of God and God will look at who we are on the inside and give us a new body and a new name that suits the person that God created in his own image. Now, if you believe that, then you're in the right place because that is the goal we are striving for. Not the best afterlife, but the best resurrection. Going from one life and living it well to the next life and living it in God's very image. 
if you want to start that life, you can start it today to come and be baptized, to turn your life around and accept who you are in God's image. And if you need prayer, if you need teaching, if you need support to get there, then we as a church offer you that. So let us pray together as we close out. And of course, come and be baptized. Come and, come and respond to the invitation as we pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, for your son, for the excellent teaching that makes transforming our lives in your image even possible. For the wonderful grace that you show and for the example that you give, Father, we thank you that you were willing to live and teach us and to die in our place. That through your resurrection we have life, that we have life today and every day for eternity. God, we pray that your message reach all the corners of the world, that it reach deep into our hearts and transform our very lives, that we may be remade in your image. In Jesus' name, amen.